Welcome back to another Biostats video. This time we'll be talking about the outcomes of statistical hypothesis testing. In order to talk about them, we first need to set up a few premises. So we're going to start with the first one, which is what are H0 and H1? H0 is the null hypothesis. H1 is the alternate hypothesis. What is the null hypothesis? It means basically, let's say for example, you're testing a drug, then the null hypothesis is the hypothesis that says that the drug does not work. The drug makes no difference between two or more groups. The alternate hypothesis says that the drug does work, the drug does cause a difference and a statistically significant difference between the two groups. So let's first understand what they mean by statistical significance, and then we can build on from that. So imagine we have a population. All right. That's the average of the population. It's at this point. Let's just say it's 10. And then this point is 15. And then this point, for example, is 5. And at these points are the two standard deviations. So anything between these two points, sorry, this is 5. Anything between these two points, it encompasses, you know, 95% of the data and this should make sense to you now what statistical significance means is that if we for example let's say have a sample and we gave them some sort of drug and then when we found the average of that sample let's say there's for example uh, a certain amount of people in here if we find that their average is beyond these two points we would say hey that is statistically significant it is very very lucky to get a, a mean here or here it is very lucky to get it so so the only logical conclusion is that hey the drug works and and for that reason we reject the null hypothesis reject null hypothesis the problem is that you can actually get a mean here and you can actually get a mean here and it, and it can completely be because you're lucky but what what biostatisticians have said is that if you get a point here, a point here, you immediately reject the null hypothesis because it's a very small chance. A very small chance of what? A very small chance that you just got it by luck. Now, what if you did get it by luck? Well, then that would be a mistake, and we call that alpha error. So again, if you get to this point, what, the, your logical conclusion is that it is so it is so rare to get a point here, a sample mean that's here. So the only logical conclusion is that, hey, um, since since there's, for example, a 2% chance of, of getting, a, getting a mean here, assuming it comes from this population, the only logical conclusion is that, hey, uh, this sample is not is not coming from this population. This sample uh, didn't really have a 2% chance. This sample is is has a drug that actually works. And for that reason, we reject the null hypothesis. But if it ends up being true, if it ends up that this 2% actually represents how lucky you got and you actually did get lucky to get this sample mean and the drug doesn't work, then you'd be thinking it does work when it doesn't work. And that's exactly what an alpha error is. Now, since since these two points encompass 95% of the data, so your chance of making an alpha error stands to reason to be 100 minus 95%. And if you check all the textbooks, everyone will say that alpha is at 5%. If you understood that premise, the following one becomes even simpler. It's just the exact opposite. Sometimes, let's say a population, sometimes you get a sample here, or maybe here, or even here, in other words, they're not beyond these two lines, which represent pretty much the two standard deviations that we were talking about, the 95% of all data. They're, they're not beyond that. So it's very it's very easy to get to get a sample mean from here. Even if the drug doesn't work, it's very simple. You just you just pick any three, for example, and then take their mean, and, and odds are they're gonna end up here 95% of the time. The idea is that what if the drug actually worked? You'd be thinking it doesn't when it actually does, and we call that a beta error when you when you accept accept h0 when it's actually false and and what's true is the, is the alternate hypothesis this would be making a mistake this would be called a beta error now what is the main difference between alpha and beta error what you need to remember is that alpha is always 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 five percent you could alter it but most journals will not accept a significance level that's changed from five percent Beta error, however, it is not fixed. Instead, it can, it can vary. It can vary. And, and the, the range of values is not really dictated for beta, but just generally speaking, it sort of hovers around 20 to maybe 30%. It could go, it could go higher than that, lower than that, but it generally is, is higher than, than, than alpha. Now, this starts being a bit clearer. I can go an extra step and actually show you one way you can make a mind map so that you never forget this. Here's how you do the mind map. First off, start with the regular population and sort of try and make it, I'll try to make it as even as possible. So this is the normal population. 
And let's say we have, for example, a sample mean right here. And this is the two standard deviations that I was talking about. Now, here's, here's what happens most of the time. Usually, let's say if you got a sample mean here, usually the drug actually works. You only really have a 5% chance of just being wrong, which is, which is very low. So most of the time, this will actually be correct. So the truth is, we're assuming they come from this population. And that's so that we can disprove the null hypothesis. The truth is, they come from this population. That's assuming that, that the reality suggests that the drug does work. The truth is, they're coming from this population. So getting a sample mean here is very common in this population. Correct? However, notice, this is the significance level we're working with. This is the significance level we're working with. So sometimes you can get some values here, here, and some values where it will creep up here. And they'll be presented on this curve right here. So notice, any value going beyond this point, you will consider statistically significant. Any value going left of this point, you'll consider statistically not significant. Now, in, in, in this curve, in this curve, it suggests that, that you know, the, the null hypothesis is true. However, in this curve, it suggests that the, the alternate hypothesis is, is, is true. So let's say you get a point here, you get a point here, you get a point here, you get a point here. Only consider this curve. Points here, when the null hypothesis is true, are a correct result. You're supposed to accept the null hypothesis. The only way you can reject it is by going beyond this point or this point. Well, let's just consider this point for, for one second. Let's consider this line for one second. So getting points here, when the null hypothesis is true, is the correct result. You're doing the, you're doing the right thing. The, the means are very close to this population. Therefore, when the null hypothesis is, is in reality true, you should accept it. However, let's move on to the alternate hypothesis being true. Notice how if we get points here, 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 they cross this threshold, so, so they are the correct result, and we call this specific correct result, we call it power. We call it power. Sometimes when the reality is that the null hypothesis is true, what ends up happening is, is just because of the, how this population is set up, you can, if, sometimes, eventually, you'll get some points here. Now, these cross the threshold. However, your, your null hypothesis is true in reality. So, so what ends up happening is you end up rejecting it when it's actually true. And we call this section alpha. So this whole section is alpha when the null hypothesis is true. And then when you talk about the alternate hypothesis, well, sometimes you can, you can get in this population, you can get points that, that go to the left of this line, and then you'd be, you'd be breaking the threshold, and then you would think that, hey, the drug, the drug is very similar, the sample mean, sorry, the sample mean is very, is very close to this population, this population right here, basically same as, as these sample means here, since this one would translate to being here, but in reality, the alternate hypothesis is true, so therefore, you should be, you should be, you should be rejecting the null hypothesis, you should be accepting this hypothesis, but instead you're doing the complete opposite, and for that reason, we call it theta. So notice, if, if, I drew the, if I drew this one more time, it's very simple. You draw two lines like this, one population like this, and one population like this. Draw a line. This will be alpha. This will be beta. This will be power. And this, this correct result doesn't really have a name. Now you probably already noticed, if this is all power, then another way you can write power is, is 1 minus beta, since beta is all of this. And remember, the whole, the whole distribution is 100%. So if this is all 100%, and this, this specific section right here is power, then, then one of the ways you can find power is just doing 1 minus beta. And hopefully then this table should be very, very, very clear to you. If the study rejects the null hypothesis, otherwise meaning that, that it accepts the alternate hypothesis, and in reality the alternate hypothesis is true, well that's a correct decision, that's actually power, 1 minus beta, that's why they say 1 minus beta. If it rejects the null hypothesis, but in reality the null hypothesis is true, hold up, you're making a mistake, you're rejecting something that's true, therefore that is your alpha error. If the study does not reject the null hypothesis, you can just remove does not reject and just, just you know, study accepts. You can just change that on the fly, just, just to make the grammar a lot easier. Study accepts the null hypothesis, and if it accepts it when, when the alternate hypothesis is true in reality, then you're making a mistake, and, that's, and that mistake is the opposite of alpha, that, that mistake is called beta. Another name for them is, is you know, type 2 and type 1, clearly as mentioned here. And last but not least, if your study accepts the null hypothesis, and well, that's, that's the reality, then you're making a correct result, and, and, but this correct result does not have a name, as you can see here. Uh, the other one is called power, but this one does not have a name.
So this brings us into the idea that, you know, when you're talking about type 1 and type 2 errors, sometimes both of them are, are, you know, mistakes, but one mistake can be more detrimental to the other. In that case, your type 1 error should, in, should, should include the one mistake that is worse than the other. In, in other words, let's say, for example, you can think that the drug works when in, in reality it doesn't, or you can think that the drug doesn't work when in reality it does. Which mistake do you think is worse? It's actually this one. You think the drug does work, but it doesn't. This is this is a mistake that's much, much, much harder to fix. And for that reason, it is always set to alpha. This is actually why we disprove the null hypothesis. We disprove the null hypothesis. We don't necessarily prove the alternate hypothesis. We disprove the null hypothesis because of this exact reason. Because we want to set up a sort of fashion where, where alpha is encompassing this mistake, and the only way we can do that is by first trying to disprove the null hypothesis. One of the things often mentioned in the book is p-value. So what is p-value? p-value is usually a percentage. It's a probability. It's a probability of getting a certain value or more extreme than that value. Now, more extreme could mean could mean both rightwards and leftwards, depending on where you are on the curve. For example, let's say this is a curve. Let's say you're interested in this specific point. So the p-value for this specific point is the probability of landing this on this value randomly or all of these points. If you're interested in this value, then the, the p-value is, is the probability of landing randomly on this point or all of these points. So you probably guessed it if, if the p-value is, you know, p-value is less than 5%, then you immediately say, hey, it is statistically significant. So once again, as a little summary, stating that there is an effect or difference when none exists, this is basically a type 1 error called alpha. When you state that there is not an effect, when one does exist, this is a type 2 error, also known as beta. Now if I draw another diagram, let's say for example this one, I'll use our same little mind map to help remind us. Now notice, if, if, if I make the two, the two uh, graphs narrower, let's say for example they look like this, and then if I made them sort of narrower, then there's less of an intersection, and that means that there's less of a chance of making an error. And think back to all the different ways that you can make a curve narrower, and they'll all be here. So you can you can increase power, in other words, you can decrease the chance of making a mistake by increasing the sample size. Yes, increasing the sample size, you'll get you'll get more uh, more people in the center of this curve, and therefore it'll end up being narrower as you keep taking in more samples. So, so making it narrower will definitely decrease the chance of making a mistake. Increasing the expected effect size, effect size basically means is, are you getting a substantial amount of difference between the two groups? And if you, if you do that, basically, let's say that the overlap is very close. So, so clearly the effect size is not really that, that, that different, but, but if you, or that higher rather, if, if you have a markedly different effect size, or a markedly high effect size, notice how there's, there's very, very little over overlap. So by increasing the effect, effect size, the expected effect size, you're basically going to be pushing this, this curve way out far, leaving less chance for intersection. Increasing the precision of measurement, obviously by increasing the precision you're making it more reliable, by making it more reliable you're making more points clumped together and therefore making it narrower. So just think, the narrower I'm making it, or the less of an intersection I'm, I'm making between the, two, between the two curves, you're going to increase power and decrease beta. One important note here they, that they mention is statistical significance does not equal clinical significance. And this is very important, this is probably the last point that we're going to talk about. Uh, but basically, if you, if you find that, for example, there is statistical significance, it doesn't necessarily mean it's important. Let's say, by numbers, you prove that, for example, uh, a drug is changing blood pressure by one millimeter mercury in systolic pressure. Let's say you statistically prove this. The truth is, it's not really clinically significant because one millimeter of mercury is not going to do anything. If someone's blood pressure is, for example, 180, bringing it down to 179 is not really going to change anything. So this is what they mean by statistical significance is not equal to clinical significance. Statistical significance means that you were able to prove by numbers that this mean was extremely lucky to get. Therefore, the drug does work. The only way we got this, this value is because the drug does work. When in actuality, just because it works doesn't mean it's going to be that useful clinically. And with that said, we covered every single point that we talked about here. 
in our whiteboards. So all our whiteboards cover all the single points that we're talking about here. There's giving you mnemonics. If you just use the mind map, you can easily tell whether you're in alpha or with beta or in power. If you draw the mind map, if you just ask yourself, is the null hypothesis in reality true? Is the alternate hypothesis in reality true? Are we making a correct decision or are we making a mistake? If you can answer all of those questions on the mind map, you should be good to go. So I'm just going to throw one little uh, example towards you. Let's say the alternate hypothesis was rejected when it was false. So here's how you use the mind map. You draw the first population, you draw the second population, you draw the intersection, and then you label this as alpha, label this as beta, label this as H0, label this as H1. So the alternate hypothesis right here, we rejected this when it was false. Well, hmm, we do want to reject it when it's false. That means we're here. That means we're in this region. We got a point here, we rejected this, and we should have rejected it because it was false. Let's take another one. Let's say, for example, the null hypothesis was accepted when it was false, when it was false. So again, draw our mind map, H0, first population, and then second population, H1, we just extended that a little bit. Draw the intersection. So this was H1. What do we say? H0, the null hypothesis, was accepted. So we accepted this when it was wrong. So if we accepted this when it was wrong, that means, that means you know, the alternate hypothesis is, is true in reality. So what ended up happening is we accepted it, but we're in this population. So we're here. So what happened is we made a beta error. H1 is the one that was true. But we accepted this one. So we made a mistake. First off, we made a mistake. So clearly it has to be beta or alpha. And since H0 is false, then clearly this one's true. So we're in this population, not in this one. So that's how you use the mind map just to help you. And that should be more than enough for any medical student preparing for a step one. I hope you benefited from this video. Consider liking and subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching.